from the Associated Press, 17-year-old arrested after two killed during unrest in Kenosha. A white 17-year-old police admirer was arrested Wednesday after two people were shot to death during a third straight night of protests in Kenosha over the police shooting of a black man, Jacob Blake. Kyle Rittenhouse of Antioch, Illinois, about 15 miles from Kenosha, was taken into custody in Illinois on suspicion of first-degree intentional homicide in the attack Tuesday that was largely captured on cell phone video. The shooting left a third person wounded. I just killed somebody, the gunman carrying a semi-automatic rifle could be heard saying at one point in the wake of the killings, Wisconsin Governor Tony Evers authorized the deployment of 500 members of the National Guard to Kenosha, doubling the number of troops in the city of 100,000 midway between Milwaukee and Chicago. The governor's office said he is working with other states to bring in additional Guard members and law officers. Authorities also announced a 7 p.m. curfew though protesters ignored it again Wednesday. Now, when I said that it was going to come to this, and this is what it was going to take to kind of calm things down, uh, I was not hoping that anyone would get killed. But we have seen a rise in street violence. And you know what? I stand behind my position on Proud Boys fighting Antifa. It's dumb. It's just really dumb. Really, really dumb. You're going to go out on the streets and just beat each other with sticks? Well, who's armed? Who's, who's you know, I, you, are we playing a game here? You go out on the streets with, with the intent of seriously injuring people and you're beating each other with sticks. Well, who, who, how do you know who doesn't have a gun? You don't. And if you're coming, if I've got a, if I've got a gun and I don't because I'm a felon, but uh, yeah, that my rights have been rescinded in the good old USSA. But no, if someone, if I'm carrying a gun and you come at me, beat me with a stick, I'm going to shoot you. I mean, this is why I carry pepper spray, by the way, and always did when I did carry a firearm for self defense to have that ability to escalate force. And apparently, it's kind of like. That's something we've moved past at this point. People are wearing masks, like ready. And I don't mean, I don't mean the Rona masks. I mean like gas masks and like full face shields and like going out to survive a pepper spray attack. But there is, there's kind of a disappointing reality that i see being put in check here and i uh did somebody have to maybe somebody had to die and i've seen the video now is it conclusive is it everything am i am i you know trying to pick apart the physical reality of the situation and say what was justified and what wasn't no because the gunman in this case apparently fired a shot uh before the fatal shootings uh, like a couple minutes before was being chased and chased out. Like, who the hell do you think you are unarmed just chasing down a dude with a rifle expecting not to get shot? Now, I'm not, again, I'm not, I'm not celebrating that these people die. I am, however, celebrating the positive impact that this shooting will have. Let's be real. There has been, uh, and from very fine people on both sides, a, a strange increase in what is acceptable for street violence. Just at protests. And, and I remember seeing this even like from when I was and I, I don't know, maybe maybe there's a trend here, maybe there isn't, but from when I was super active in the anti-war movement, you know, 2007, 8, when uh, we were still debating whether or not we should have been in Iraq, 
you you could get in somebody's face in the street. There were arguments, and I was engaged in these. And I this was the most pressing issue of our time by far. I would get protested hosting Iraq Veterans Against the War events where I was speaking by the uh, gathering of eagles. They would come out with protest signs, and I would go out and talk to them, and we would talk. And sometimes they would get carried away and they would get in my face and they would yell. But we didn't fist fight. We didn't beat each other with sticks. <clears throat> I don't mean to sound like, yeah, back in the good old days of protesting in America, we could have same conversations on the street corners. Well, yeah, in a way. <laughs> yeah, there might be a lot of truth to that. Because what I've, I've seen this and I've seen... I've seen the right wing complaints about left wing street violence and they're legitimate complaints. And then you hear, oh, well, proud boys, we're going to go out and we're going to go fight Antifa in the streets. And it's like, no, you, you don't have a right to go and beat up people because they're protesting. And I know that that's oversimplifying things and it goes both ways, blah, blah, blah. But no, stand your ground, defend a business, defend property use appropriate force to defend that property. You'll put them in their place soon enough, and that's what the shooting represents. There were protesters who thought it was a good idea to just physically rush and assault a dude with a gun. And that's, like, no, that's not okay. That that needs to stop. And it is, it is at least being put in check here. And I don't think there's a single protester in America right now who's been a part of the Black Lives Matter uh, riot slash protest who isn't going, oh shit. Yeah, if you violently assault someone who's armed, they might shoot you. Knock that shit off. Protesters marched past the intersection where two people were shot Tuesday night, stopping to gather around the spot where one person was shot and to pray and lay flowers. Dejan Span said he decided to join the demonstration because of those killed the night. One of those killed the night before was a friend. As he said, I couldn't take it anymore. I couldn't just sit there and watch my friend die. Evers, a Democrat, issued a statement asking those who wanted to exercise their First Amendment rights to please do so peacefully and safely. Yeah. Now, I, do, is, is it really the governor's business to tell you how to exercise your First Amendment rights, if that's, if that's what it is, to do it safely? Well, no, it's not safe to protest in America, governor. Have you seen what cops do to protesters? Yeah. So, and urging others to please stay home and let local first responders, law enforcement, and members of the Wisconsin National Guard do their jobs. Really? Let them do their jobs of suppressing protest. Let them do their jobs of enforcing victimless crime law. That's, and you know what? I, I was reading the story, and I'm like, how did they identify this guy as a police supporter. It seems like a bit of a contradiction, right? Because this is a guy coming in to say, the police are not capable of doing their jobs. I'm going to go in and I'm going to help them. Like that was actually a part of, like, this is actually, the guy did, this 17 year old did an interview before this and you go, really? It's, it, this is kind of following a template at this point. Now, there's one other important part of this story. According to witness accounts and video footage, police apparently let the gunman walk past them and leave the scene with a rifle over his shoulder, his hands in the air, as members of the crowd were yelling for him to be arrested because he had shot people. As for how the gunman managed to slip away, Sheriff David Beth described a chaotic, high-stress scene with lots of radio traffic and people screaming, chanting and running conditions he said can cause tunnel vision among law officers and i'm thinking like okay tunnel vision that would mean focus on the guy who just shot a couple people right no what are, what were they looking at through these tunnels 
Rittenhouse was assigned a public defender in Illinois for a year on Friday on his transfer to Wisconsin. The public defender's office had no comment under Wisconsin law. Anyone 17 or older is treated as an adult. Now, here's the interesting part about Rittenhouse's background. Much of Rittenhouse's Facebook page is devoted to praising law enforcement with references to Blue Lives Matter, a movement that supports police. He can also be seen holding an assault rifle. Now, this is like the most the poor, confused soul. Who is it that enforces gun control, Mr. Rittenhouse? The cops you're supposedly supporting. In a photo posted by his mother, he is wearing what appears to be a blue law enforcement uniform, as well as the kind of brimmed hat that state troopers wear. I mean, this is this is a bootlicker. This is now I wonder if this guy is, you know, looking to shoot someone. And this is, I think the the, the major part. That, that is yet to be determined that, that that I haven't seen properly really teased out in any analysis of this is to what degree did Rittenhouse contribute to the confrontation that lead, led to these deaths, right? And he might be responsible. Now, you, you see in the video, protesters coming, you know, they're just running to try to get a gun away from him. Um, maybe that's justified. You know, we don't know what happened right before that, at least not yet in its entirety. So, I, you know, it's possible. I would not be surprised if they decide that, uh, you know, that, that he really set this up and that, that he is guilty of contributing to these deaths. Now, obviously, it's not murder. Is it, you know, involuntary manslaughter, you know, un intentional homicide? Uh, we're going to see that teased out. This is a story that is going to be picked apart for a long time. Now, according to the story, what he did for his interview uh, before the shooting, and by the way, this was Daily Caller in front of a boarded up business. He said, so people are getting injured and our job is to protect this business. And part of my job is, is to also help people. If there is somebody hurt, I'm running into harm's way. That's why I have my rifle, because I can protect myself, obviously, but I also have my med kit. So one of the interesting things about this, and this really does cross like back and forth across some strange political lines. The Wisconsin Lieutenant Governor Mandela Barnes, who was black, said in an interview with the news program Democracy Now! that the shootings were not surprising and white militias have been ignored for too long. Quote, how many times across this country do you see armed gunmen protesting, walking into state capitals and everybody just thinks it's OK? People treat that like it's some kind of normal activity that people are walking around with assault rifles. And by the way, in Wisconsin, as the story notes, it is legal for people 18 and over to open carry without a license. So white militias. I don't know. I've, we, we just interviewed Tony Simon about diversity shoots for Second Amendment is for everyone safe just yesterday. We've seen black militias forming, but that's, you know, th this is a really interesting challenge here because what the Lieutenant Governor is referring to walking into state capitals, I'm pretty sure that's, that's a Wisconsin reference where we saw protests around the shutdowns just a few months ago with the infamous pictures of militia members standing in full garb, just walk because you can walk into the Capitol armed. And, that right should be exercised more often to keep politicians in check. And by the way, another interesting line of history being crossed here. How did that become a thing, Lieutenant Governor? Would, would I have to remind you that it was the Black Panthers in the 60s who did this carrying shotguns onto the floor of the California State House in protest? Yeah. And is it white militias? I don't know. Now. Here's the thing. This is this is this is a bit of a you know interesting kind of reverse racism, but white militias have been ignored for too long. That doesn't make any sense in explaining Rittenhouse, this shooter, because he was pro-police. Militias, by definition, are at least. Comp competing, if not anti-government.
to say we don't want we're, we're, we're organizing an armed force as a militia to defend our communities, to serve our communities, and if anything, to put a check on government power to assert that the founders were right, that we should not have a standing army. We should have a militia-based defense. So this guy's not really militia so much as volunteer police auxiliary bootlicker squad. Now, witness accounts and video indicate the gunman first shot someone at a car lot just before midnight, then jogged away, fell in the street, and opened fire again as members of the crowd closed in on him. A witness, Julio Rosas, 24, said that when the gunman stumbled, two people jumped onto him, and there was a struggle for control of his rifle. At that point during the struggle, he just began to fire multiple rounds, and that dispersed people near him. As Rosas said, the rifle was being jerked around in all directions while it was being fired. Blake, 29, was shot in the back seven times. This is kind of back to the, the original shooting that has spurred this round of rights and protests. This is Jacob Blake, 29, was shot in the back seven times on Sunday as he leaned into his SUV. Three of his children seated inside. Kenosha police have said little about what happened other than that they were responding to a domestic dispute. And so there's more about this backstory here on this um and it looks like blake's probably not going to walk again um so there's a bit in the story about the you know the political back and forth joe biden has something to say uh, vice president pence has something to say they're sending in federal troops and this is actually coming with a lot of dangerous consequences and uh, CJ, if you would go to my Twitter feed and pull up this thing that I retweeted from at Riot Kitchen 206. And these are people who go out and, and support protests as the completely peaceful, we're just going to feed people uh, groups. And, and this is, I mean, it's kind of funny. They call themselves Riot Kitchen, right? Um, so this story I have from KenoshaNews.com, law enforcement in Kenosha started arresting those out after curfew Wednesday night, according to multiple online reports. Curfew went into effect at 7 p.m. Wednesday, an hour earlier than previous nights, although marchers still moved through the streets, chanting without much hassle from law enforcement. Sundown occurred just after 7.30. Yeah, that's the video, CJ. And go ahead and play that with the audio, please. So this is scary. What you're what you're watching appears to be a silver van full of people pulled up at an intersection, surrounded and blocked off by unmarked vehicles. And the police here are acting really erratic, un unmarked. And you know, I'm I'm trying to look at at uh, markings on the officers themselves. One of them, the back, he's wearing a black shirt. The black, the, the back of it just says police. Nothing. Nothing. Yeah. And so this is a woman recording with her cell phone from across the street. Police go, yes, you heard that. Smash a window in the van to pull someone out and then get in the vehicle and drive it away from the scene after scrambling going, oh shit, let's, let's uh, you know, back up and, and unblock this intersection here. And I mean, this is, this is scary. You know, and, and, and there's a lot of, bullshit to be distracted was just people honking at a cop driving a vehicle that he just stole on the street like, and the, the, the thing about busting the wind like and this was after seconds from an officer showing up at the side of the vehicle just decides to smash the window now i don't know like what do are these are these the terrorists that, that we have to be a domestic terrorist been sent in by Soros funded groups and you know we should celebrate that they're being arrested well not like this not without accountability and it is really disturbing I think there is a factor with Corona right now and Portland and Minneapolis and all the cities that have had really strong responses 
to individual incidents of police brutality recently. And it's so easy to get polarized. And we're going to go, oh, man, I hate to even do this. We're going to go to Mediaite.com. Tucker Carlson on Kenosha violence. How shocked are we that 17-year-olds with rifles decided they had to maintain order when no one else would? And yeah, this, this is a good point, right? That if the police are failing to secure your community, you got to go out and do some vigilante defense. You got to at least go out and defend yourself, your business, your home when this is a real threat. And it is. Now, again, in this particular incident, was it justified? What happened before? We'll see. But as Tucker Carlson said, the chaos has reached its inevitable and bloody conclusion. It's hard to call it the conclusion, but this is certainly a change in what we're going to see for honestly dynamic. So there was a response to this, unsurprisingly, the next story from Mediaite. Tucker Carlson's take on Kenosha Vigilante horrifies Twitter justifying a double homicide. And yeah, that's this is the this is the polarization that we're seeing now that everybody is looking at this through a biased lens, myself included. I'd like to say I'm uniquely capable of looking at things objectively because as a libertarian, I'm not prone to the emotional arguments that people use to justify left flavored statism or right flavored statism. And what I'm seeing in this is like I I I just Again, like I said yesterday, I hope that everybody says in response to this, hey, we're not, no, this is serious. And not that I wasn't serious before, but uh, this shit is getting out of hand. And this is really dumb. So Trevor Noah, our next story for Mediaite, to go all the way to the left. And by the way, Trevor Noah has just been... This, the Daily Social Distancing Show is this version of The Daily Show? No. Pathetic. And I, I don't know. I, I, I can't do a good impression of Donald Trump, but I can do a pretty perfect impression of Trevor Noah doing a shitty impersonation of Donald Trump. Okay, so Trevor Noah faults Kenosha police for treating a shooter better than Jacob Blake for some black skin is the most threatening weapon of all. That, that, woo, yeah, hot take here. Last night, uh, late night host Trevor Noah faulted Kenosha police for treating a vigilante who allegedly shot and killed two people better than uh, Jacob Blake, questioning why some people get shot seven times in the back while other people are treated like human beings and reasoned with and taken into custody with no bullets in their bodies. I'm like, yeah. There's there's a lot of reason to be upset here, but there's something I, I do really want to point out that, uh, that that Trevor Noah and I are totally on the same page with, and I think at this point in history, technology, where we are, there's no excuse for not having a better way of taking someone down. So here it is. Noah questioned how Blake's shooting escalated so quickly, wondering what happened to the methods used before, resulting in violence such as warring shots or tackling he said quote that's all we have i mean think about it even when wild animals are loose on the street they have tranquilizers they have nets i never thought i would wish for black people to be treated at least like a wild bear but here we are yeah and that's kind of a you know simplification of this but there's, again, tasers, pepper spray. Even beyond that, you have someone who's running tranquilizers. Like, how, do, how do we have cops not carrying tranquilizer guns? How is that not? A, we have military. I mean, look, you look at the photos of police on the streets today. Do you know how much it costs just to outfit one super cop? with a helmet and riot gear and fatigues and a gas mask and a rifle and a pistol. And oh, I see the um, picture I'm looking at now, a guy's wearing knee pads. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Make all the knee pad jokes you want. But those things aren't cheap. 
and you, you do have to get on your knees to lick boots. So it does make sense as an appropriate expenditure here. But why not invest in ways to take people down without killing them? And you go, well, Adam, that's that's why we need police reform. We need we need more government to come in. It's, and it's like, no, no. And there's a simple solution. You go, why does this exist in the first place? Why, what is the incentive that allows cops on the street to go, I'm going to shoot first and ask questions later? Well, qualified immunity, lack of accountability, and the general paradigm of not holding police accountable for damages that they cause as individuals, as you would have with a free market system. Now, it's only because of government that you can shoot someone and say, well, I, I was just doing my job. In the free market, oh, you shot someone. Well, guess what? There's a family here of people who are going to sue the fuck out of you. So there's a really easy way to say, look, we, we, we don't have to do this anymore. We, we don't have to have cops with this paradigm for use of force. And I, I think about drones. I mean, it's funny, Trevor Noah uses the uh, the net example, like cargo net. Yeah, drop a net on someone. How, how do we, why? Like, and he, there, there was a guy killed in Phoenix earlier this week because he was hogtied. They, they actually cuffed him behind his back and put his feet connected to his hands and then had him face first in the Phoenix asphalt. Do you, do you know how hot it is during the day, even at night, inhumane? I mean, the guy had, you know, he was affected. He died because of the stress and the heat exposure that the cops put him in. Because they, they, he ran. And what, what happened? This, is, I know, this is just a, another petty example, but there was a nine one one call in Phoenix. There is a guy acting suspiciously at the corner of this intersection. This intersection. Here's his description. Don't call 911 unless you're willing to kill somebody by accident in order to deal with the situation that you're facing. So that's what happened here. Vigilante justice would have been a lot more appropriate. The cops roll up with three squad cars. Dude just freaks out, starts running. So they, they, they get him on the ground. And they kill him. Accidentally, perhaps. But there's no excuse for this. Why? Why? Why do we why do we see people doing that? Tranquilizer guns, cargo nets, drones. You don't have to chase anybody. If you can shoot someone with a with a tranquilizer dart with a tracking chip in it or something, you have a drone, follow them. You'll never lose them. And we have these cowboy cops who just don't care. Oh, well, I get to run around with a gun and I'm protected. I'm safe. I can just beat people up and throw my weight around and chase people down and shoot them in the back. And it doesn't matter because I'm not going to be held accountable anyway. If you had a free market system or a system where people were accountable to the market and the communities that they're supposedly serving as law enforcement operating in the interest of the public safety, supposedly, you wouldn't even have this paradigm at all today. You wouldn't, these techniques wouldn't be a thing. Because now, if a police department kills somebody by accident, yeah, it doesn't cost them that much. If they were truly accountable for it, they would either be going out of business or they would be forced to change their techniques to ensure that they're not responsible so, for so much damage to life property life life limb and property yeah, cops go out and just wreck shit all the time and never get held fully accountable for it so our next story is from yahoo.com la times melissa elad writes a long history of militant activism keeps protests alive in portland now this is from three days ago august 24 why am i wrapping up the segment with this story Bear with me. It has become a dangerous nightly ritual in Portland. Around 11 p.m., protesters set fire to trash cans or toss burning cardboard into police buildings 
and hurled bottles, eggs, and chunks of concrete at officers. Then police broadcast an order for the demonstrations to leave. Most do, but a hardcore group, sometimes numbering in the hundreds, remained to face off against police who used tear gas, rubber bullets, flash grenades, and arrests to clear the streets. Three months after the death of George Floyd at the hands of Minneapolis police, the nationwide Black Lives Matter demonstrations, it sparked have died down, except in Portland. Now, remember, this was three days ago. Uh, they have not died down, or they have undied down in some other places as well. Keeping the protests alive here is a local brand of activism with a long history. Its adherents support the goal of ending police brutality and racism, but their larger purpose is to dismantle what they see as an increasingly authoritarian government that suppresses the rights of citizens. Police to them are the front lines of the enemy. Now, you might think the enemy of the enemy is, or the enemy of my enemy is my friend, but that's not always the case. And it's sort of like with Black Lives Matter. I'm, I'm, I'm an ally. I'm not a supporter. I mean, symbolics of just, just being an ally make me a supporter. I'm not an active supporter. I don't think I ever will be. I, I see the overlap in, in terms of what I am advocating for, for a nonviolent world of peace and harmony and freedom with some of the things that they're calling for. But <clears throat> that's, that's not really what this is. This is definitely of a whole other leftist strain. As of last week, protesters had set 41 fires, thrown projectiles at police officers on at least 58 nights, and vandalized property on 49 nights, according to the police department, which has declared riots 17 times. The protesters, who are largely white, defend the nightly taunting of police, along with vandalism and destruction of property as a strategy to draw officers into clashes and expose them as fascists, a term with a potent past that has become a mantra at rallies and online. As one Portland music producer who carries a plastic shield and walkie-talkie to patrol the edge of the demonstrations and keep out far-right extremists said, it's not okay, I'm sorry, it's to try to push the line just above what's acceptable in order to get them to respond to show their abuse of power. I hope this is a revolution and I hope it continues. Now, about these kinds of protests, like I, I've been, I've, I've covered stuff like this, I, you know, in the anti-war protests. I, I've been, you know, in, in protests that have, have gotten into, you know, direct confrontations with law enforcement, but never for this purpose, never for this strategy of saying, we're just, we're going to taunt them and, and expose them. Now, there's a lot that you can, you know, you can, you can talk about in terms of debating the effectiveness of this. And part of me wants to say, yeah, yeah, say, you know what? You got out there, you made the police look like the dickheads that they are, and now the American people are a little more aware of that. But you also gave them an excuse to justify their budgets. And you've also pushed a lot of people away because you have become the monster you are chasing. Past, is, what, what, what was the quote? just beyond the level of, of what's acceptable, but you're, you're, you're engaging in violence. Now I'm, I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not like here as some passive is saying, Oh, violence is never justified or property destruction can never be justified. No, like I'm, I'm all for the tactics when used effectively and righteously and to destroy government property is in a sense, uh, you know, uh, justified certainly when that property is being used against people. I mean, government property, it's like saying mafia property, right? Uh, property owned by a criminal gang that they have no legit claim to in the first place. If you can take it back, that would be preferable if you have to destroy it. Okay. But this is direct violence towards police. This is escalation. This is aggravation. And I would refer you to an article uh, study that we've covered several times on this show that historically speaking, nonviolent revolutions are more successful and enduring in their successes than violent revolutions. This isn't a revolution. This is a spasm 
of violence in the streets of America motivated by the left, motivated by Antifa, BLM, the Democrats who are trying to manipulate things for the election, of course. But like Antifa and Proud Boys fighting in the street, this is a dumb dance. It's a dance. It's a performance. Literally, why, why are they doing this? Why are these protesters in Portland being violent towards the police? It's a performance. And it's not a good one. Anytime you increase the conflict, the aggravation, you make it more difficult for there to be peaceful progress. So if you want to be a part of a violent, fake revolution, get out there in the streets. Antifa, Proud Boys, BLM, Ken and Karen, all of you out there who just are looking for a fight, fucking knock it off already. You want to be a part of the real revolution, the peaceful revolution? It's right here with the Libertarian.